the button okay So hi, hello everyone. Um, today's talk is by uh, Barney, Barney Martin. Uh, we, uh, he will talk about uh, quantified CSP and the future of the Chan con conjecture. All yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Jakob. So um, I'm not really going to present anything new today, but I'm more going to talk about how I could imagine the future future work on quantified CSP. So um, I'm going to give a sort of personal and historic background to the current situation um, before talking about some um, the monsters that Juk has made. He is the, the opposite of St. George. St. George is killing the dragon. Dima is building the dragon. Um, but also there are other people involved backwards in this work, like, of course, Hubie and uh, Florent and Katarina. Um, and so instead of talking just about the demise of the Chen conjecture, I want to talk a little bit about the future of uh, work in QCSB. So normally when I'm giving this talk, I start off with a definition of the CSP, but probably I don't need to do that for um, CSP seminar, but people who are working in the CSP maybe have no uh, close connection to the QCSP. So I, I will uh, explain to them that the QCSP is very like the CSP in its logical formulation, but with the universal quantifier somehow returned. So instead of the logic being just exists and an equals, the logic is um, for all exists and an equals. And this version of the constraint satisfaction problem, this variant of the constraint satisfaction problem makes sense um, makes sense logically, doesn't make sense so much as a combinatorial problem like the homomorphism problem. It's a generalization of the CSP very much in its logical formulation. So I was writing some survey about QCSP. Um, CSPs are ubiquitous in computer science while quantified CSPs uh, cannot merely claim to be so important in applications. And this is probably true. I actually remember um, when I first heard Manuel say that the CSP is the Koenig's problem because of its connections to combinatorics, to logic, to al algebra, but also many, many natural problems are phrased as CSPs. Whereas with QCSPs, there are natural QCSPs, but they tend to be Boolean. The Boolean one, the, the quantified Boolean formulas is a very natural QCSP. The other, the non-Boolean QCSPs are somehow not so natural because there's no way that you can restrict the constraint language and um, produce relativization of the universal quantifier. Of course, you can produce relativization of the, of the existential quantifier by adding unary relations, but because the formula is still conjunctive, you can't relativize the universal variable. And actually the version of QCSP where you do relativize both the universal variable and the existential variable that I hasten to add is not a QCSP in the sense that I just described has already been classified. So in fact, the um, classification for this relativized QCSP um, has been done by, by Hubie and Manuel and the classification for the Boolean um, QCSP was done well, it was, alluded to in Schaefer, but the, the algorithms and the removal of constants was elaborated over a number of papers subsequently. A note that in the case of the CSP, the relativized CSP is exactly the conservative CSP, but the relativized QCSP is not the conservative QCSP because in the relativized QCSP, you really can relativize the universal quantifier. You can't do that with unary relations, what I call the conservative QCSP. So I said in this, um, I said in this survey that what is left of the, the, the true non-Boolean QCSP is a problem I believe to be mostly of interest to theorists. And I would probably stick to that. Um, what I didn't realize at the time that I was writing this is how interesting it would be to theorists. It, I, I, I think it is a very interesting problem from a theoretical perspective. 
very interesting and very mysterious, unfortunately. So um, nonetheless, finite domain QCSPs have actually been heavily studied in the literature and for a long time have been known to reach complexities P, NP complete and P space complete. So there are also possibilities of complexities within P, but for the purpose of this talk, I will not consider anything within P. So actually one can consider like a really big class of problems. Basically, these are the problems of model checking. So the CSP is a model checking problem where you fix some um, finite structure and you fix a fragment of first order logic. And the fragment of first order logic is this one here, either exists an and or exists and and equals, they're roughly equivalent. So why not take all of the quantifiers and connectives of first order logic and consider all the subsets that you can have and come up with a whole collection of, of ensembles of problems, a whole collection of problems where you fix the logic and then you look over all finite structures. And remarkably, um, most of these are not so interesting. There are several that are more or less trivial the CSP is very interesting, quite rich. It's rich within polynomial time, um, but outside of polynomial time, we know it's not so rich because there's just P and NP complete. So the classification is somehow straightforward, not the proof of the classification, which was not straightforward, but the classification itself is fairly straightforward. You've got P and NP complete, and you can separate between them by weak near unanimities in the core, something like that. Um, instead of having exists an and, you could have for all and or, this is a De Morgan dual. So you basically have a mirror of the CSP dichotomy, but now between P and co-NP completes. Um, down here is maybe the only place apart from the CSP and the QCSP where you have a little bit of structure because you have both P, NP complete, co NP complete, and P space complete. There's no great surprise that there's co NP complete here because you've got a fragment of logic that is self dual. You've got um, for all, which is the dual of exists, you've got all, which is the dual of and. No one was looking at some. Um, this QCSP classification here that is not symmetric. It's symmetric in the quantifiers, but it's not symmetric in having and and or. No one was looking at this and thinking that complexity classes other than P, NP complete and P space complete would, would, would appear. It's something of a shock that they have done. And it's actually, that's one of the key reasons why I still think the problem is of enduring interest to theorists because of the strange things that we now know that are going on here. So since the resolution of the fate of Vardy conjecture, everything is classified here except here in QCSP and it's dual. And um, it seems the classification here is, is looking complicated still. So what I find most interesting about um, these problems is the interplay between first order relational structures and first order functional structures that are usually called algebras. What is the interplay between the relational and the functional? Um, something that Kiesler um, wrote, or, or it's written in Chang Kiesler, I, I can't attribute it to one of the authors in particular, is this claim that model theory equals logic plus universal algebra. I, I, I'm not sure that many modern model theorists would say the same thing, but um, it maybe did apply to the, the historic background in model theory. I rather like this, um, particularly also when we are studying infinite structures and then the model theory seems to play a stronger role. So the interplay is something that um, everyone at the seminar will be very um, comfortable with, very familiar with. The first order functional structures have their operations working column wise on the tuples of the relations in the relational structures. Um, and then when we map elements that were in the tuples that were in the relation again to something that's in the relation, we get um, something that we call a polymorphism and we get these objects, pole and in. And I tend to write 
relational structures in calligraphic notation and functional structures in blackboard notation. Although I think at some point, yeah, this, this is fine for most of the talk this way. So um, playing a key role in many of these classifications is a, a Galois correspondence. And for both the, the CSP and the QCSP, there is a Galois correspondence. Um, and the one that is working for the QCSP involves surjective polymorphisms instead of polymorphisms. And surjective polymorphisms are not closed under composition. So the object that you get is no longer a clone. You would have to have a clone restricted to its surjective operation. So it, 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 it's something slightly strange. Um, and so as a result of that, mostly people who have been studying QCSP tend to study the case where all constants are available, are definable in this logic for all exists and and equals. And this is equivalent to restricting to the uh, operations being idempotent. And of course, idempotent operations are subjective. So you basically get to a situation where everything that you are used to for the CSP, um, you can use again for the QCSP and there are no terrible surprises. For the CSP, it's well known that you can restrict to the idempotent case. There's no such equivalent theorem for the QCSP. Um, and maybe it's not true even. So there are various ways to define the QCSP. I defined it before in its traditional formulation. Um, another formulation is an algebraic formulation. And this is a rather non-standard algebraic formulation that is non-standard for good reason that will become apparent later. So if we parameterize it by a, um, by a, by a clone on a finite domain, then have the input as a sentence phi in the QCSP logic, maybe with a quality, it doesn't matter. And some concrete relations that are invariant under the, the clone. And then you ask, is the sentence true on the on the, on the structure B that was in of this clone. And obviously in B is an infinite structure. For sure it's an infinite structure. It may not even be finitely related. Um, and so there are questions already here of, of encoding. Um, so if you deal with, a, with an in B that is infinite, there are different ways to deal with it. You could deal with um, arbitrary finite approximations of it and then say it's NP hard if some finite subset is NP hard and it's polynomial if everything is polynomial. There, there are different ways to approach this. Um, traditionally, you don't approach it by allowing actually something, some object that really is infinite tend to approach it by studying arbitrary finite subsets of it. But I want to attack it in this slightly unusual way of allowing it to be infinite. So for a long time, my interest in this was brought on by um, something that Hubie observed. And let's just talk about the, the growth rate of generating sets for direct powers of an algebra. So for an algebra A, we have this function um, giving the cardinality of the minimal size generating sets of this sequence. So this is of um, coordinate length one, this is of two, this is of three. And you ask, what is the smallest subset such that under the, um, operate, um, under the, the natural action of the operations of the algebra, you generate all of the tuples. So this is, this is this method here. I'm imagining that this is these are the things in the generating set. And once I've got a generating set, then I can actually use operations of the algebra and I can generate any tuple. That's the idea here. And we're interested sort of in these two possibilities. One, when there's a constant C such that the growth rate is bound by um, I to the C, so it's polynomial. And another where it's exponential, so the polynomial is an upper bound, the exponential is a lower bound. Um, it's not immediately obvious that there isn't possibilities, there aren't possibilities in between. Why not sub-exponential? Why not b to the square root of i? 
So this is not clear that there should be a gap there. Um, what is known, it, it was originally this, prob this, this problem was studied for groups and their groups are always polynomial. So there's some kind of gap between logarithmic and linear. The first time you sort of start to get exponential behavior is with semi-groups. Um, and the observation is that if B is a finite semi-group, then there are two possibilities. Either B is a monoid and you have the PGP linear even, or B has the EGP, it's fully exponential. So the polynomial case is super easy because this is the generating set. So you can imagine um, when I apply the um, operation of the monoid along here, I just repeat whatever was there. And here I repeat whatever was there and there repeat whatever. And that means I can actually get any tuple. I can obviously get any tuple. So the generating set is of size n times n, uh, which is linear. Even. On the other hand, um, if there is no identity, then you have this property that if th 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 there is a, so what's going on here, that for each element, um, the action of that on some on the domain must crush the domain from size n to something smaller. Because if, if it weren't like that, you could iterate that element and you would to, to get an identity. That's the idea. And not only does this hold for B, it actually holds for powers of B. And so then you, you argue that a subset of B to the M size R can generate no more than R. That's what it started off with. And that is the size that it's generating from this inequality, R times N to the minus one to the M elements in B to the M. So a generating set must be of size 2N over 2N minus one to the M. Now N is fixed, the size of the um, domain, it's fixed. Um, M is the thing that is growing. So here we've got fully exponential behavior. So at some point, Hubie was studying QCSP and he studied a particular property of constraint languages and algebras that he called collapsibility. And collapsibility um, is something that's a bit like what's going on here, actually. This is something that's called one collapsibility. Um, and after a while, he studied a form of PGP that he realized wasn't explained by um, collapsibility. And he called it switchability. And his original definition is reasonably, it's not difficult, but it's not totally straightforward. Whereas this definition is super straightforward. So we just say that an algebra has a certain, we call it PGP switchable to sort of distinguish it from Hubie's switchability. Um, and then this version of the simple version of switchability has the property that the generating set are tuples that when you read them from left to right, only change elements at most some bounded number of times, some at most k times. And this is like a simple form of switchability. The original form of switchability was introduced, as I say, by Hubie, and it's based on something called reactive composition. Um, it was introduced in regard to the QCSP where Hubie proved that switchability of the algebra actually dropped the QCSP into NP. This other form of switchability he knew dropped the QCSP, the bounded alternation version of QCSP into, um, I guess, NP. So he knew it for the bounded alternation version, but not for the unbounded alternation. And in a paper, um, a few years back, we proved that actually the two coincide, the more complicated form of switchability and the um, simpler form of switchability coincide. And the proof here is heavily logical. It's, 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 it's working through the, log through the logical characterization. So um, this discussion about the, the, the separation between PGP and EGP originated in groups, was generalized to semi-groups and such like. And then Hubie, amongst others, took it up for clones. Um, and there was also work 
by Keith Kearns and Agnes Zendere. Um, and they made some sort of small progress. And then um, quite remarkably, um, Juk solved it in one fairly simple argument. Um, and he proved that either there is the EGP or there is the PGP, and moreover, the only type of PGP that you are getting for finite algebras is this simple switchability. Um, and in fact, this proof even holds in the, in the non-idempotent case, which, which really smacks of some kind of witchcraft. Um, so before this had happened, um, in, a, in an, a, a set of essays or works dedicated to Dexter Cosen, who was Hubie's supervisor, Hubie, Hubie wrote a, an article about some um, meditations on, on, on the QCSP. And he, he, this, is, this is a form of what he conjectured, so a finite relational structure with it all constants. So if we have the PGP, then we're in NP, otherwise the QCSP is P-space complete. And this is, the, this is the original form of the Chen conjecture, and in fact, it's the union of two conjectures in that original paper. So Zhuk is making this um, strong progress by proving that in fact, um, that there is a dichotomy between PGP and EGP. So in Chen's original formulation of the conjecture, he didn't say that you have PGP and you're in NP or you have EGP in a P-space. He didn't say that, but it would surely have been on his mind and he knew it held in the domain three case, the gap between PGP and EGP in the idempotent three element case. He didn't state it like that, but it would have been surely on his mind. And so once Zhuk has proved this thing, it seems like this should be something that we can make progress on. This should be a conjecture that's, that's, that's approachable. And in fact, um, it wasn't known at that time, but it became known later. The Fader-Vardy conjecture was proved independently by Bulatov and Zhuk. And they saying that B is a finite relational structure expanded with all constants. So if the polymorphisms have a weak near unanimity, then you're in P. Otherwise, your CSP is NP complete. And that would actually turn the Chen conjecture into a trichotomy conjecture between P, NP complete, and P space complete. Um, so yeah, this is the new form of the, 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 the Chen conjecture with the knowledge of the Fader Vardy conjecture proved that you would have a, a trichotomy. And it seemed, you know, like the sort of part way there. So let's talk about the life of the Chen conjecture before the death of the Chen con conjecture. Um, I already mentioned that I want to do something slightly abhorrent. I want to consider infinite constraint languages and infinite constraint languages can be encoded in different ways. So for example, this, the not all equal relation can be encoded by listing the tuples or it can be encoded in sort of Boolean logic with constants and equality. And this version of the encoding is in general going to be a lot larger than that version of the encoding. Um, and it so happens that if you choose the DNF encoding, you get a form of the Chen conjecture. Um, you get a form of the Chen conjecture that, that when you have the PGP, this algebraic formulation of the QCSP is in NP, well, that holds in, in all formulations. But the other way around, only holds in this weird sense where we have this weird encoding. And we don't get P-space hardness, we instead get co-MP hardness, and we can't improve that. You actually get some co-MP membership there. Um, so then it begs the question maybe of a form of the Chen conjecture where we look for finite subsets of this. So if A satisfies PGP, then for every finite subset of inv A, we get the QCSP is in NP. Obviously that is true. Um, it's this next bit that's a bit dodgy. Otherwise there exists a finite redux so that QCSP B is co-NP hard. 
And this conjecture is the same as this revised Chen conjecture where we replace this strange encoding with the tuple encoding, um, and it's false. So if we use the tuple encoding, the Chen conjecture is not working. But if we use this funny encoding, the Chen conjecture does work. And this sort of compact version of the Chen conjecture is, is also failing like the tuple encoding version is failing. Um, so how are we proving this? It's very simple. Uh, we are using the characterization of Zhuk. Um, and Zhuk pro proved that in the idempotent case, it doesn't hold in the non-idempotent case, but if you're in the idempotent case, then EGP always coincides with some kind of relation that's definable. And if you look at this relation, if you look at rho, it's kind of equality. Um, so the really interesting cases happen here where alpha and beta overlap. If alpha and beta don't overlap, you can prove the Chen conjecture. You're laughing. The problems arise when alpha and beta overlap. And you might as well always just think of um, alpha being naught and two and beta being one and two. So two is the overlap. And then you could look at this row. It's kind of an equality relation, but it accepts twos as being equal to one. You know, except for two, it's an equality relation. So instead of looking at an equality relation, why not look at a ternary version of an equality relation? Um, it's a bit ternary. So it's a bit like three-way equality, but it has this problem with the element you overlap on. And it turns out that Zhuk's proof is easily showing that this relation also must exist in the clone. And then everything is straightforward because when you turn, when you look at the negation of this problem, you turn three-way equality into something that's basically not all equals. Um, so you, you, you reduce from uh, uh, the complement of, of an NP-complete problem becomes something like this. And this relation is exactly the thing that we just proved we can, we can, we can, is in the clone. We just proved it's in the clone. So it's in the clone. Um, sorry, the relation is in the co-clone. It's in the co-clone. But what I can't guarantee is that there's a succinct PP definition, or QCSP definition. But I'm working in this crazy situation where we allow um, the relations to be encoded in whatever DNF in this in this way. I don't have to worry about the, the the succinct definition, and so I can say that it I, I, in my new version of the problem where relations are encoded in this way, I, I've got I get co-NP hardness here immediately. It's it's a trivial thing. It's a trivial thing. Um, yeah, the interesting cases happen when, when the overlap is, uh, is non-empty. And then you get this thing that's co-NP hard, but also in co-NP. Um, but every finite redux is in polynomial time. It's the thing that refutes the, the one of the alternative versions that I gave earlier. So when you make a deal with the devil and start using this crazy encodings with DNF and whatever, you end up getting this co-NP complete case. But it's not a finite, it's not a finite constraint language. It never, I never thought from this that we would find a finite constraint language whose QCSP was co-NP complete. No one was thinking that at the time. Um, and in fact, We, we were still thinking that the, 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 the traditional definition of the QCSP and the traditional Chen conjecture, right? This is again, the updated version of the Chen conjecture with the proved fate of Vardy conjecture. People are still thinking it should be true because if we have the EGP, we just need, um, we just need these polynomial size definitions. And actually we can even use universal quantification here of tor n from B. This should be something, shouldn't this be possible? 
And this, um, actually these polynomial size definitions or short definitions are things that are studied by um, Wallström and Lagerqvist. And I know, I, I saw Magnus is here. Um, and it seemed like we just needed this additional trick. Surely there should be this trick of how to compute um, these things. It should be possible. And then we could prove the, 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 form, the, the, the original form of the Chen conjecture. It should still hold. But then the, 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 the things, the, 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 the nightmare begins. So we've got these simple relations on a three element domain. Um, and you can see this second one is a bit like a, an encoding of and. So Naught, naught is naught, naught, one is naught, one naught is naught, and one, one is one. It's an encoding of and, but it's got this sort of, um, accepts a lot of tuples that have got a two in them. And this other relation we can express like this. And this is a finite, a very simple finite constraint language who's on a three element domain, whose QCSP is um, co-NP complete. So this is a, you know, the, the, this is something inauspicious. This is this is quite a quite a counterexample to Chen conjecture. But then things actually get worse because there are these um, constraint languages that have where that where the where the, the polymorphism clone has the EGP, but the QCSP turn turns out to be in P. So with the um, uh, with the strange uh, DNF encoding, of course, we're co-NP hard here, but without that, we're in P. And what does that mean? It means that, yes, there is no polynomial size definition here. And so not only is it there isn't a polynomial computable definition, Juk is proving that there isn't even a, a polynomial definition. It cannot exist. So, um, there are in fact these two different language, basically these two up to up to sort of autom up to sort of automorphisms, as it were. There are two different types of domain three language that have this property, where where the, there is EGP, but the um, um, but the QCSP turns out to be in P, and um, it gets worse because once you start having co-NP complete. QCSPs, you can start building monsters, more monsters. DP completes, um, DP is the NP minus NP or NP and co NP. Theta P2 is a strange class that I often forget the definition of, but it's something like um, P with a, an oracle in NP of logarithmic length, something like that. But still, um, Juk was able to tame the madness at the three elements level. There's actually only P, N, P complete, co -NP complete, and P space complete there. You have to go to higher domains to get these other monsters. So where am I going here? So where do the monsters originate? They originate with the co -NP complete cases. The CoMP complete cases allow the building of the monsters, and actually, for the rest of the talk, I want to talk about the CoMP membership. So, um, I call it the Olshak Juk method because um, Mirek actually, I think, is, has exhibited that, that there must be these finite domain ones in. Um, there must be these finite domain ones that are CoMP complete first. But the lemma I'm going to give here is due to Zhuk. So on a dom domain of size three, an operation is called uh, zero stable if fx zero maps to x and fx two maps to two. And s is a well-known idempotent semi-lattice that maps everything to two whenever a is different from b and otherwise it's idempotent. So this S has been studied quite a bit in the literature. Um, Hubie introduced it. The QCSP of inv S is P space complete. There are, there's a finite relational language invariant under S where we have P space completeness. And this P space completeness is actually due to Bulatov. 
But what Zhuk is proving here is that when you have this zero stable operation as a polymorphism, I should mention that this one generates S. Then, a, then an arbitrary instance of the QCSP actually drops to an equivalent pi two instance where roughly speaking, you replace the universal vari variables um, with existential variables um, and set these new ones to zero. So it's reminiscent in a strange way of Hubie's original ideas of collapsibility and switchability, but they drop uh, an instance to NP and this method is going to drop a met or drop an instance to pi two and then to co NP. And why is this method so important? Because this is in fact building the monsters not just where we have co NP membership, it's actually also playing a, a key role in the polynomial time cases, these ones with EGP that are in polynomial time, because it's the a polymorphism of this kind is first dropping the, the complexity to pi two, and then there's gonna be a polynomial algorithm. So how does this lemma work? Okay, one way, um, the downward direction is somehow the easy direction. If we have a solution of the original instance, then it is also a solution for new instance with the additional assignments where we, we get the scolum functions for when we planted the universal variables for zero. So this is the simple direction. Now the harder direction is the one where there is the real contribution. So let's try to follow the proof here. So consider solutions of the new instance such that we have yi is a scolum function involving now for the moment all of these variables because they're all before all the universal variables are before and let's pose the question is is there an, a minimal n such that f of n the scolum function depends on xj for some xj bigger than its index and in particular we would like that no such n exists so we're going to assume for contradiction that such an n does exist and choose it to be minimal among all solutions. Why is this really potent? Because if we can prove that no such n exists, then we automatically get that this thing implies that thing because the existential variables simply don't depend on the tail end of the universal variables. That's the very thing that's being proved here. This is the heart of the proof and it's, a, the, it's the novel observation that gives this proof. So we assume for contradiction that such an n does exist and we, achieve, we, we choose it to be minimal among all solutions. So we get some solution here where we set all of the zeros after n. And here we've got some functions there. Now, um, we just redraw that tuple in a certain way. I think it would make sense maybe, um, Jakob, for me to post my well, there's no need. This is this is basically as it is written in the in the stock paper. I agree, it's not so easy to read now. But what Juk is doing is he's looking for all of these variables after n, and he considers all possibilities that can go there. So we're over the domain two, zero, one, and two, and then we get a huge number of solutions here, and then we apply to all of these the semi-lattice operation S that we had. So I gave S as a binary semi-lattice, but it plainly has a version that, that is of arbitrary, ar arbitrary finite arity, where it basically maps um, idempotently, but then everything else we get, gets mapped to. And then we get this property here that the, the action here of the um, semi-lattice is mapping this to C only if it goes to C for every one of these. And if it goes to, to a single constant for every one of these, then for sure it wasn't dependent on of any of these. That's the observation. If it works for all of these, you, we can, then it wasn't dependent on them. And then the, otherwise there were more than one possibility that could go there. And that's where we're gonna use the semi-lattice to say that, well, in fact, we could have answered two. We could always have answered two there. And so by this other method, it was also independent of all of the things before. 
And then we just use a single application of the, the zero stable operation to generate a solution of the instance such that FM doesn't depend on, on these numbers. So either it didn't depend on them because it was always the same, or we could have answered two because we use the semi lattice. That's the observation. And then we contradict the minimality of N. So it's this remarkable proof that is proving that we can compress these instances into a Pi 2 form, and then we can solve the Pi 2 form with a co NP oracle. So, um, where is the Chen conjunction going? So, using um, the idea of polynomially building the, um, the, the Tor relations, um, give, giving them a polynomial PP definition actually allows a, a fairly straightforward proof that the Chen conjecture does hold in what I call the conservative case, when the language has all unary relations. It's fairly easy to say that we don't have to have the stupid form of the Chen conjecture with um, the NF definitions of the relations. We really can give the PP definition um, because the, the conservative case is so well behaved. Um, and it seems like the conservative case is like some kind of natural largest class in which the, the Chen conjecture holds. What to do with the Chen conjecture in the future? Well, I don't know. Could we modify PGP and EGP in some way to now make the Chen conjecture true? May, I'm obviously not the Chen conjecture that has the trichotomy between P and B complete and co and B complete. It would have to be more sophisticated. But for me, the most interesting um, direction for the Chen conjecture is to try to prove generic results about co-NP membership. So how do we take the olshak juk method and extend it to a wider range of languages? Because the olshak juk method is also accounting for the QCSP monsters that are in P. So we already have this general method to prove membership in NP, and it's called switchability. Maybe if we then had some general method to prove co-NP membership, we could take out also um, co-NP cases. And then I suppose we could try to prove DP hardness for the rest. I, I'm not sure exactly what to say. So, um, do we, is, 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 did, is Hubie with us at all today, Jakob? He wasn't there at the beginning. I don't know if he... No, I don't think maybe, so. No, maybe he will. Maybe he will. Uh, he will see see the see the uh, the slides at some point. So, in 1900, a famous mathematician called <laughs> um, gave a list of problems that would sort of set the agenda for mathematics at the turn of the 20th century. And uh, in 2019, um, another mathematician called <laughs> came also with some problems. Um, and Hubert's problems are these three problems. So he originally gave this in a triple A um, workshop. I think, I think it was originally in 2019. And he asked um, for the complexity, well, he asked for the, these three problems. So the first one, Hubert one, is a QCSP. It's an infinite domain QCSP. The second one was the complexity of a surjective CSP known as a three no rainbow problem. And the third one was some nonsense that I can't remember. So um, Hubert II has been solved by Zhuk. Um, and I'm going to stretch myself here to, I can't say that it's certain, but um, I somehow think Hubert I is in co -NP. And this is the this is why I'm so interested in the general methods for CoNP. Um, I kind of feel like it could be in CoNP. So I um, I tried to assemble a, a crack team, um, a Russian, um, a Pole, 
this is Jacques here. No, this is Jacques here actually, and this is Verona here. And maybe for, I mean, for a mathematical quest, we should probably also have a Hungarian, but I didn't yet get a, get a Hungarian. Um, but maybe one day we can quest uh, to solve for Hubert one. So maybe this is, um, yeah, maybe this is a bit bold because it's not totally straightforward, but um, I would, I, I, I dream of it being in Cohen P and I dream of the, I dream of the Juk method, the Olshak Juk method to prove it. So maybe I can end here. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, are there some questions? Comments? Country examples? Um, Barney, I think your, your composition of the team is very suitable for attacking QB3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do, do you, um, as a, here's, a, here's a, a poll, does, does, does anyone in the audience remember QB3, Hubert 3? So I, I unfortunately can't remember, I, I can't remember what it, I know it's in, a, it's in an area I, I wasn't working in. I will. Um, so it's somehow, it's somehow related to one of the papers that he worked on with Matt, um, Matt Valeriote, I think. It's, it's, it's a question there, but it's, uh, I, I couldn't remember the formulation. So actually the reason I write um, some nonsense is because I can't remember the formulation, not necessarily because it is nonsense. Okay, I will just look look for it. Maybe I can find it. Uh, okay. Um, Barney, maybe I, I can ask this question. So is, is there a hope to identify some uh, class of structures where you, you have something smallish, like you know, tetrachotomy or whatever, not no monsters? Okay, but this, this is the idea. Maybe Dima has something to say. So if you, we have already a generic reason for NP membership, except for some monsters. So if, if you could generalize this co-NP membership to general co-NP membership, maybe both of those would remove all of the monsters, you'd kill the monsters. Um, and then you could have, okay, then you could look for, yeah, in NP or in co-NP versus DP hard. This would be a possibility. The other obvious possibility now is to look for um, in, NP by um, Turing reductions, say, or DP hard, something like that. Or no, so, or NP versus NP hard under Turing reduction. So that would include co NP hard and NP hard. But the problem with that is you would have to know all of the monsters that are within P and the monsters within P look problematic. If you actually stretched tractability to include co NP and NP, you might be able to kill those monsters. Dima, what do you think about that? To be honest, I don't believe you can do this because um, like, <clears throat> we still don't know whether we have uh, these six classes or we have much more. And okay. uh, my so guess would be that we have more. Okay, yeah, but what about the, the idea of extending this lemma to a general lemma for co-NP membership, because it talks about something very similar to collapsibility. It's a collapsibility though of, of the existential quantifiers, not the universal quantifiers. So could there be an, a general generalization of this like switchability that explains all of this co-NP membership? Yeah, I agree. I really like this idea because uh, like we need to generalize PGP and we need to do something just to no, find out when we can. To, you don't have to, if, if you could generalize this, you could keep traditional PGP and EGP, I think maybe, because um, this method already covers the monsters that are EGP, but in P. Okay, let me ask you another question. Um, what if we consider QCSP, which is just Pi 2? 
what do we need to get the classification for pi two formulas? Yeah. So to get a classification, we need something better than PGP we have now. And this idea just explains how to how to go from any formula to pi two formula and when we can do this. Yeah. But I agree, this is very good question. Like when can we apply this idea? How can we do this? And also I really like your Hubert one. I started to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing about Hubert one is it has some polymorphisms. So yeah, it's, but what, unfortunately, what does, sorry. Can I, uh, can I stop you? What, what does the relation actually mean? Uh, what, what is this implication? So, ah, sorry, the equals, it should be equals here. Sorry, I make a typo. Yeah, oh, this okay. is equals. Yeah. <laughs> ah, it's a typo. Yeah, I wrote it today. Sorry. Okay. Cool. Now it makes sense. Um, you can continue, sorry. <laughs> no, I have nothing. Mm. Hopefully now Juk is looking it's at just this. Just a comment on this. Yeah. Go on. Uh, the comment on this relation is that it's the last missing case to complete uh, a dichotomy, uh, not dichotomy, a try. Uh, yeah, or, so, well, Manuel, Ma so Manuel, you, always, you always told me that it would solve the, the full classification if it's p-space complete, but you weren't sure if it were in co-NP. Um, but Hubie told me that it would, e either way, if you could prove this is in co-NP, it would also be enough. Right. Do you, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, so, so what, what's the class of problems we are looking at? We look at all structures that are preserved by all permutations. Yes, all it's equality languages. Certainly is. And uh, then, yeah, there are p-space uh, uh, complete cases. For example, if you modify this relation so that it is for airy and it has x equals y implies u equals v, then it's p-space complete. The CSP would, even with this equality would still be in p but the qcsp would be p space complete and now here we our original proof failed and we we just proved co -NP, uh, hardness yeah but if you have co -NP membership of this that because there's a, a a load of problems somehow between perhaps between x equals y implies y equals z and x equals y implies u equals v um and it's is that class of problems in between solved? All right, all right. Uh -huh. But Hubie, you, you once told me you weren't sure if there were CoMP membership here, but Hubie, when he gave this talk, said it should, um, if you proved CoMP membership here, it should settle everything. So did he say that to whom? He said it. He said it. Um, I asked him specifically when he gave his talk in Durham. Oh. But ah, it's good because yeah. this is a nice region to revisit anyway. Um, we, we have with Michael Pinska and Hubi, we have only a partial classification and right. this range is still not fully explored. So, so the question is what polymorphisms uh, exist on this structure that don't exist on X equals Y implies U equals V? Oh, this I can tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but you wipe out lots yeah. of, cons you, you wipe out lots of polymorphisms immediately in that paper, right? So, um, because we're not considering just idempotent Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, some last chance for questions. Yeah. Um, maybe one question. So uh, now, in for QCSPs, are there any results the, where the equational structure of the algebra helps you, or does? Are there some identities that maybe imply PGP or something or? Yes. In general, no? I, yes. Yes, there are classes of polymorphisms that imply PGP. Um, but are they, are they equations of, of amounts of conditions? They, they're to do with sort of, for example, surjectivity at each coordinate. I'm not sure they're mouth surf conditions actually, but the um, many idempotent mouth surf conditions do imply tractability. Like, uh, okay, um, um, so mouth surf does. Uh, 
um, near unanimity does. Semi-lattice in general doesn't. Um, some semi-lattices, you can have P-space complete QCSPs, like this, well, the one I mentioned actually, this semi-lattice. Semi-lattice with units is tractable, but semi-lattice without units is not necessarily. Uh, thank you. May, may I comment this uh, on this? It's, uh, so, so what is known is that, that the, the complexity does not just depend on the variety generated by the polymorphism clone. This is known, huh? this fails. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess that's all. Um, let's thank Barney again.